welcome from IntelliCAP and Sankalp. I welcome you to the first day of the 13th Sankalp Global Summit. Uh, thank you for joining us for the Using Deep Tech to uh, Drive Structural Impact for an Inclusive Society session presented to you in partnership with Impact Investors Council. Before we begin, a few house rules. To start with, please introduce yourselves in the and the organization you represent in the chat box. During the panel discussion, I request you to keep your mics off, but feel free to engage in the chat box, drop your questions and comments there. We'll be collecting questions for the panelists, so make sure you do that and use the chat box actively. And uh, the rest of it, uh, I think that's about it from my end, but with that, once again, a very, very warm welcome. And I'll hand over to Ramraj Pai, CEO Impact Investors Council, to proceed with the session. Thank you. Thank you, Trina. And uh, thank you, uh, Sankal team, Urvashi, for this opportunity for us to be here. Uh, my name is Ramraj, and I'm the CEO of the Indian Impact Investors Council. Uh, today's session is really uh, talking about uh, the power of deep tech to create structural impact uh, you know, and, and support the movement towards an inclusive society. Uh, this uh, is a very interesting topic, and this is something that at the IIC we felt that uh, you know we should we should structure, because traditionally India is known as a country where uh, you know we are considered to be good uh, in terms of you know using existing technologies and kind of sort of innovating to create unique models which are relevant for us uh, in the Indian context. But slowly but steadily we are seeing. Uh, the progression uh, towards our own unique, uh, you know, IP-based or uh, you know, unique uh, deeper technology kind of solutions, and that is really what uh, this session is all about. I'm going to begin by giving you a quick, uh, you know, ten-minute sort of presentation on you know this whole concept of impact investing. There are lots of myths, there are lots of misconceptions, there are lots of different perceptions about what impact investing is all about, what's the state of impact investing in India, uh, you know, and there, there, there are various kinds of thoughts that people have. And I thought that I could just begin with a quick 10-minute presentation on the impact investing, the Indian impact investing landscape, following which I will hand over to a, a very, very, I must say, illustrious panel of entrepreneurs, uh, asset managers, and investors who are seriously uh, engaged in the deep tech impact industry space. So that's the quick sort of broad idea of what is it that we have on the table. Uh, I have a few slides and, uh, you know, feel free uh, to keep this as interactive as possible. Ask as many questions as you want. We have about 90 minutes. So with that, let me just uh, dive right into the presentation. Let's move on, Vedan. Very briefly about IIC, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, the IIC is uh, India's uh, you know, preeminent not-for-profit industry body to strengthen impact investing in India. And our whole job is really, if I have to put it in two lines, two things. One is, how do I bring more private capital to the social impact sectors? That's the first one. And the second is, how do I engage with the government to create a more facilitative regulatory and policy environment for impact investing in India? So if someone asked me, what are the two, uh, what are the key main things we do? I would speak about these two things. How do I bring more capital and how do I work with the government? How do I partner with the government to create a more facilitative environment? We are a member-based body and we enjoy support from many, many active impact investors, including Omidyar, uh, Avishkar, uh, LFR Equity, USA, Chirate, Port Foundation, Dell Foundation, and others. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, that's, we are, we are, a, we are a small organization of about eight, 10 people based in Mumbai and Delhi, and we work with a variety of investors, as well as government organizations, regulators, etc. Let's move on with that. Okay, here is quickly, what is the understanding of impact investing? And, uh, you know, very, very briefly, I would say, impact investing really serves dual objectives. You know, one is, it has to generate measurable beneficial social impact one second is it also has to create financial returns so impact investing is really about investing in organizations which have the capacity to create both social impact along with financial returns and over the last 10 to 12 years this is emerging as an alternative asset class where investors are providing capital and support to for-profit social enterprises 
normally when you think about social enterprises people always believe or think about them as not for profits i think it's very important to say that uh, you know and i think not for profits do a fantastic job that you know social impact is created not just by the not for profit people who are working in the social impact there is also a capacity for us to create market based solutions for social impact and that is what impact investing is all about okay some of the basic constructs of you know how will you look at it and when will you call something an impact enterprise one is intentionality the enterprise is set up with an idea that it can create something which benefits society second is it tries to serve the basic needs of low income populations it could be education it could be health it could be financial access it could be you know areas like climate change and so on and so forth so these are the two parts which are the social impact perspective i think the third perspective is really once you've taken the elements of you know, the social impact side of things you need to be able to scale them and make them large and make them very substantive uh, to create both scale scalable impact as well as financial return because you generate your financial return once you reach that certain size and scale so as you can see even in these three boxes we have the social impact perspective and we have the financial perspective so that's a quick kind of brief on impact investing let's move on yeah so just some more uh, sense about impact investing i think there are lots of thoughts that oh impact investing is esg investing oh impact investing is like uh, you know philanthropy we talk to a lot of people say no sir i am already doing philanthropy so you know impact investing i am already doing so i think this is a slide which hopes hopefully will give all of you some perspective for many of you this may be familiar my apologies you know some of your you know it may may be a you know a, a double repetition or something like that but broadly if you really look at it you see the two arrows one is the for profit side the other is the not for profit side the for profit side at the extreme is really just saying that i want returns you know rest of you just i don't really care for what's happening to stakeholders and so on and so forth. so that's if you can say the for profit side which is the deep end of for profit complete commercialization the other side is really pure play not for profit which says that i'm here to do philanthropy i'm here to give grants i'm here to give money to people who are very very underprivileged that's the other end so if you really look at within for profit there are new elements of investing which have emerged one is what you call a socially responsible investing which really says that hey, you know what i want returns but i will not invest in sectors which i believe are ethically or otherwise questionable so there are as you i'm sure many of you know there are multiple sectors like there are many many you know organizations or people who have belief systems about alcohol and you may have belief systems about meat uh, these are all organizations or these are all people who have their own individual beliefs and we are not here to pass any judgment on you know whether that is right or wrong but that is one way of investing which is really do no harm the other concept of esg investing is the concept of esg investing and esg investing essentially remains for profit but here you are tracking your performance against key environmental social and governance metrics you are not changing the basic premise of the organization you continue to do whatever it is you are doing but you try to create a more holistic orientation towards engaging all stakeholders and not just the shareholders which has been the traditional way any normal for profit organization operates okay so this is the for profit so now you look at the not for profit side I already spoke about philanthropy which really creates social impact these are just grants given then you have program related investing which is really where along with the social performance you are also at least saying that okay if i give you a million dollars i'm hoping i'll get that back what we are trying to do in impact investing is something in the middle where we are saying boss we need market based solutions which can solve the problems that our lower income underprivileged people in this country have we need to solve those problems we need to create the social impact at the same time we are saying we will solve these problems not just by giving away money yes there is a time and a place for and a sector where that is needed but there is a time and a place for us to create market solutions which can create that impact at the same time they can also generate material profits so i think impact investing is something which is trying to stand somewhere in the middle and say that we need to be able to balance both of these things and this is a concept which is very very relevant for a country like india where already so much was broken i would say post pandemic the gaps 
in terms of the offerings, the services, what is it that we can provide to our underprivileged people is even larger than it would have been two or three years back. And that is why we are seeing increasing degrees of interest in impact investing and people coming up with multiple solutions which are able to solve for both the problems or for profit as well as um, creating that impact. And, and we have multiple such organizations that are today started off as small impact enterprises and over a period of time have grown. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, quickly, high level, how does impact investing work? I mean, essentially a lot of the startup of impact investing is in venture building and early stage de-risking. So we have lots of impact investors who support very, very early stage ventures. They support uh, driving the innovation, building the, uh, you know, the product market fit, looking at the minimum viable product, uh, leveraging both some amount of philanthropic and blend capital, blended capital, some seed capital. So there are a lot of impact asset managers who will do this piece, make the organization, help it to grow to a certain level, at which point in time you are able to really catalyze commercial capital because at that point of time, commercial capital comes in and says, hey, you know what? We are seeing some great interesting stories here. Uh, they, are, they are able to create good returns. They are also able to create social impact and then commercial capital kind of comes in. So really the story of impact investing is in impact asset managers and capital who support the innovation and efficiency in delivery that you know, early stage organizations can bring and, and de-risk some of the business models by leveraging a variety of capital sources and essentially bring in, in the future, lots of commercial capital. This is a sector which has seen more than $15 billion of mobilized over the last 10 years, more than 800 plus impact enterprises, and maybe about 500 million people who've been impacted in India. That's a quick summary. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, you know, substantial uh, contribution towards achieving SDGs in India is a very busy slide. I'm not going to talk a lot, but if you really look at the chart on the right, you can really see how a lot of these organizations are hitting SDGs, pretty much all of the SDGs. Obviously, SDG 5 is, is one, which is, which is pretty substantial. SDG 8, uh, you know, are, are some of the larger SDGs where we see a substantial impact. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, quickly, uh, you know, as I said, it's about $15 billion which have been mobilized by impact enterprises. Uh, 2020 was about $2.6 billion. And as you can see in this pie chart, what are the key sectors where we see a lot of fundraise? About 25% uh, is raised in organizations which are in financial inclusion. About 25% is in education. And uh, we have agriculture, which is also kind of getting a lot of interest in, in recent times, which is about 17, 18%. And then we have a whole host of other sectors, including areas like technology for development, climate tech, uh, you know, and other sectors, healthcare, and so on and so forth, uh, you know. So that's a kind of quick summary of, of the market. And I'm going to get into a little bit more detail here. Let's move on. Okay, here is a quick summary and a snapshot for you all to get a sense. So as we said, uh, you know, and you must have seen the number of 15 billion and here you may see 12 billion. It's just a, a, a difference in the base. 15 billion was 2010 to 20. But if you really see 2016 to 20, it was about $12 billion about 600 enterprises, and as I said, about 500 million beneficiaries. This gives you a bit of a sector snapshot. And as you can see, we have enterprises in agriculture, education, healthcare, financial services, technology for development. This is a, this is a very emerging new space where you are really using technology to disrupt uh, and create new products for new markets. But traditionally, if you see the use of technology, the, the low hanging fruit is really using technology to create new methods of delivery or new methods of customer acquisition for existing customers. But I think tech for dev really uh, is a segment which is trying to create new products for new market segments. Um, say when I, people who cannot, not, not English speaking or, or people who are looking for uh, jobs in say blue collar workers. So this is a very different kind of segment. Climate tech again is an area that we are seeing uh, emerging in recent times over the last um, two to three years. <clears throat> so that's a quick <coughs> sort of summary of Indian impact investing. It's a, it's, a, it's a rapidly growing space. We are seeing lots of commercial investors get more and more interested. In fact, I would say five, seven years back, if 100 deals were done in impact in the seed stage, 80 of them, 70, 80, 35 of them were funded by impact investors and 25 would be funded by commercial. 
Today, I would say if there are 100 deals which are happening in the seed stage, about 50 of them are being done by impact. And maybe 50 of them already have a commercial uh, investor presence, which really showcases that commercial investors are seeing value and seeing that this is a relevant sector that the capacity to create social impact along with strong financial returns is real and possible. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, it, you know, and, and at the core, as I said about impact investment, you would have got a sense. I think innovation is at the core and innovation can be in a variety of ways. I don't want to get into too much detail, but you, know, you can really look at innovation around developing unique products and look at innovation where you're sort of working on the process and changing the way you're delivering something. And at the core, you can also look at tech-enabled business models, uh, you know, which, which really use technology to create new offerings and generate new demand. So, you know, we, we have multiple examples and maybe on the next slide, I can just show you briefly uh, some examples which are there. Uh, can we go to the next slide, Vidal? Yeah, these are just some very, very, uh, if I may say, brief examples. Uh, this is just for purposes of illustration, by no means are, uh, you know, we would want to say all, all good organizations, but, uh, you know, this is just uh, some examples that we have here. So, you know, uh, whether we look at organizations like Indify, which are creating hassle-free customized unsecured loans to MSMEs, or Dehat, which is an end-to-end -end agricultural services platform in local languages, CropIn, which really uses a lot of big data analytics and AI to predict, uh, you know, a variety of things in agricultural production, uh, Niramai, which is a low-cost automated uh, breast cancer screening solution. So we have a variety of organizations which can exist here. Uh, you know, Vedantu is another organization which has been really doing well in creating interactive virtual tutoring platforms uh, for K-12 students. So these are just some examples to give you a flavor that these are real living successful organizations. Reverie is a company which is now acquired by Reliance, but, uh, but yes. It was a multilingual tool to enable local language internet usage. Let's move on. Okay, quickly, uh, last slide, I thought it's important. I spoke a lot about the entrepreneur side of things and you know how, the, you know, I think it's useful for us to look at who are all the players in this particular space. So you have players, both international and domestic and uh, players basically are obviously of three types. One is asset owners or LPs who own money. They are putting in their own money. So they can be insurance companies, they can be development finance institutions like CDC, FMO. They can be foundations and family offices like the Susan Dell Foundation, which is putting personal money of Michael and Susan Dell, um, personal money of Pierre Omidyar. Uh, those are foundations and family offices. So these are people who are putting their own money or really are more, you can say, LPs. Then you have asset managers. And, uh, you know, there are international asset managers like Noveen, Responsibility, Triple Jump. You have a lot of domestic asset managers. You, saw, you have some of them on the panel. You have Rema from Ankur. You, will, you have Vidya from Chirate uh, and others uh, who are here. Then you also have the domestic uh, financial institutions like SIDBI and NABAD who either invest in some of these organizations, impact organizations directly, or they could also support an asset manager and invest in that particular asset manager. We are also increasingly seeing the presence of family offices domestically uh, who are getting interested. Uh, we've seen investments from Mr. Munjal's family office, from Narottam Satsaria, who, by the way, was the earlier owner of Gujarat Ambuja Cement. You have Mr. Vikchandani, I'm sure that's a familiar name, uh, who is obviously the owner of uh, Nokri.com, has investments in multiple very successful startup ventures. You have the Patni family office, Pramod Basin earlier of G Capital and so on and so forth. So you have a variety of players who are participating. And I think what is important for a lot of you to appreciate and understand is really that this is a segment which is seeing greater interest. Uh, we are seeing today LIC made their first investment in the impact space in one of the uh, domestic uh, you know, asset managers. We are seeing other institutional players get interested. We are seeing more interest from HNIs and family offices, as well as internationally also more and more people are looking at India as a very central uh, space where impact investing is thriving and growing. So I think this is a space which is, which is as commercial as it comes, but at the same time, uh, there is a strong orientation towards creating distinct social impact. And I think it's that blend really which, which creates both the opportunity as well as the challenge. 
that's pretty much what I had, uh, unless we're done in my old age, I have forgotten, no, I think uh, that's the last slide. So thank you all for this opportunity. Uh, I'm hoping this gave you all a little bit of perspective. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Vidya from Chirate Ventures to use this sort of, if I may say, foundation to really go into the depths of the whole conversation around how we are creating a really vibrant ecosystem for uh, deep tech impact entrepreneurs and investors to, to really create significant change in our society. So over to you, Vidya, and uh, please take it up from there. Thank you. Thank you, Ramraj. That was a very, very comprehensive uh, discussion and introduction as well to impact investing in India. Um, and I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for having us on the panel. We have an excellent group of speakers here. It promises to be an interesting discussion and a very good morning to, or good afternoon, good evening to all of you who have joined us uh, from all over the world. I'd like to kick this off by starting with a brief round of introductions from the panelists. I'll invite each one of them to go around the window and we can go in alphabetical order. So starting with you, Anand. Thank you, Vidya, and, and thanks to the organizers for putting this together. Hi, I'm Anand. I'm the co-founder of a company called Bugworks. Uh, that's a US, Bangalore, India, Australia-based company. And we're trying to solve a very large problem uh, that has to do with lack of antibiotics to, to take on superbugs. So we're working on superbugs and oncology solutions, um, deep science, and hope to make it uh, accessible to all. Thank you. Kiran, would you like to go next? Sure, yeah. Thanks for having me uh, all, uh, much appreciated. My name is Kiran Mysore. I'm a principal and head of global AI investments at UTech. Uh, UTech is University of Tokyo Edge Capital. Uh, we are a $900 million venture capital firm, uh, independent fund based out of Japan, uh, investing in global science and technology companies. We've invested in over 100 companies over the last 14 years, uh, two thirds Japan, one third global. Uh, I live in Japan as well, uh, and I lead our global AI investments, uh, and uh, my background is machine learning, so I mainly look at AI-related companies in healthcare, in manufacturing, uh, and in deep tech in general. And uh, about India itself, we are fairly bullish. Probably we are one of the uh, few global deep tech funds who is looking at India, not just from a market standpoint, but also as a global innovation hub, uh, the solutions that India comes up with, which could potentially impact uh, India as well as all around the world. So we've invested in over four or five companies, uh, five companies in India now, cumulatively about $40 million invested in India in the last uh, three, four years. Uh, Bugworks is actually one of our portfolios. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thanks a lot. Rema? Hi. I'm Rama Subramaniam, co-founder of Ankur Capital Fund. We are an early stage fund investing into technologies for the next billion. And um, so we, uh, our current fund is $55 million. This is our second fund. We are all set to raise our third fund in the next few months. Agri-tech and health tech was a core focus of our first fund. This, this fund, we are more um, diagnostic, though agri and health continues to be one of uh, our core sectors. Our interest is on deep tech and India, uh, tech from India going global. That's our, uh, our uh, core uh, philosophy and we're looking to uh, invest, uh, provide the, the air beneath the wings of folks like Anand who want to go global. Thank you, Sri. Hey, uh, my name is Sri Kumar. Everybody calls me Sri. Uh, so I'm actually uh, one of the co-founders uh, um, along with a bunch of very young people of C6 Energy. And uh, actually, uh, you know, over the past 11 years, uh, our focus as C6 Energy um, has been to really create a very new and disruptive solution to tackle climate change. The way we do that is, uh, actually I'll tell you more about it later, but the way we do that is by pioneering uh, what I call the next frontier of agriculture, which is actually agriculture on the oceans. And using that material to really make a variety of sustainable products that can have a big impact on climate change, food security, 
uh, and, and uh, multiple other things. So uh, this is actually something that is very passionate uh, for me. I mean, I, we had, uh, you know, I, I'm, I've had a lot of experience in the pharmaceutical industry, but uh, this I believe is one of the most exciting journeys I've ever made in my life. So I'm thrilled to be here to share what I can about my experience. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, sir. and I'll end with a brief introduction to myself and Chirati. I'm the VP of uh, Impact uh, of the Impact Practice at Chirati. Chirati Ventures is an early stage tech focused VC operating since 2006. We were earlier known as IDG Ventures in India and we operate across uh, multiple sectors. So far since inception, uh, we've uh, our assets under management are about a billion uh, US dollars across four funds. And we've made about 100 plus investments. Uh, we are ESG integrated for risk since 2016 with our latest two funds. We are 2X challenge certified. Uh, and through our impact practice, we are measuring, we are contributing, and we are advancing the impact that our portfolio companies create. If you look below the four uh, top sectors that we are uh, investing in, we are investing in fintech, in agritech, healthcare, small business growth, logistics and mobility, sustainable consumption and manufacturing, et cetera. For us, deep tech is a horizontal. Um, currently, it largely spans from on the impact side, it spans healthcare, climate change, robotics and education. And a few of the companies that, you know, we have invested in uh, some examples are manufacturing natural colors for use in textiles and industries using microbes in the space of biologics in the space of uh, making uh, manufacturing prosthetics advanced prosthetics for upper limb am amputees. Uh, silver coated cathedrals to bring down hospital infections, so on and so forth. So with that, I'm going to kick off the panel by having us all set context in terms of what is deep tech and how does it differentiate itself from technology per se, right? So it could have different meanings and context to the audience. And I would like to kick this off with all of our panelists answering these three questions. What does deep tech mean to you? Where does it dovetail into creating impact? And what are the high impact and high return areas both in India and globally that you are seeing? Again, I'll request we go around the window in alphabetical order and uh, Anand, we'll start with you. Great, thank you, Avidya. So I just wrote some notes when I was trying to define what is deep tech, right? So I think deep tech companies are, they have the main objective of providing technologically advanced solutions based on a massive, scientific or engineering challenge, right? And these are major, major disruptive solutions that impact everything that's dear to humanity, be it environment, agri-tech, fintech, healthcare, climate change, et cetera. The big, big, the top three things on the WHO will be climate, health, and other important SD, SDG connotations. Deep tech impacts SDG of nations and the world, right? What defines these companies that are using deep science, deep innovation to solve these big problems? Very lengthy R&D. Research and development can be seven to 10 years, sweet spot, which means you need a large capital inflow into such companies, very high science or engineering risk. So the risk is more on the execution side because of innate unknowns, unknown unknowns, as they call it in science and engineering. Some market risks, are also there because you have to bring your solutions and make it affordable and accessible to people and access is not a given. And I feel that the underlying issues that are being solved with you are so big that they automatically create companies that provide very high intellectual property work. So it's very hard to do an impact based company, a deep tech, deep science company and not produce IP that's world beating. So your intellectual property is amazing very, very high barrier to entry. So differentiation is very high. Severe risks in terms of execution, uh, right? And finding the right investors to take you along with it. But the ones that are my favorite in terms of how we can change the world are climate, health, and food. I come from a semiconductor background. So I, I would love to think about aerospace and semiconductor materials also as, as disruptive that are changing life. But what is so visible and visceral are health, climate slash environment and agro. And I think it's these kind of companies that are going to make disruptive solutions in what matters most to humanity. 
Thank you, Anand. And uh, if I turn to you, Kiran, uh, what does deep tech mean to you? And where do you see it dovetail most into creating impact? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for that. I, I think Anand put it well. So I'm not going to repeat that, but like I think to sort of double down some of the things, uh, uh, anything that is fundamentally uh, defensible and difficult to replicate, uh, which often has intellectual property, and the two types of deep science innovation or deep tech innovation that we see coming anywhere in the world, especially in India, is one is science led innovation and the other one is engineering led innovation. Science led innovation usually originates from academic. Uh, universities or corporate labs, and they are fundamental science discoveries which push the boundaries in some form of, or the other, right? Bugworks is a great example. It's medicinal chemistry, structural biology, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Aerospace is another example. Semiconductor is another example. Quantum computing maybe is another example. So those are the ones which are characterized by science-based discoveries uh, with a problem in the mind at the end of the day. The second type of innovation is engineering-led innovation. Uh, which is a syndication of several different things. For example, we have a portfolio company called Tricog in India, which is a combination of uh, interventional cardiology uh, plus embedded systems plus machine learning. So the way in which the syndication of technology works uh, fundamentally pushes the boundaries in a certain way. So those are engineering-led innovations as well. So both these types of innovations have different type of impact. Uh, and one of the things we try to work out is like, if you imagine a two by two matrix, Let's say on one side, there is obvious ideas and non-obvious ideas. And the other one, there is capital intensive and asset light. So forget the obvious ones, especially the non-obvious ones, the so-called deep tech ones used to be capital intensive, right? How can we use principles of multiple things in order to make them sort of asset light? There are one ways to do it is like financial engineering, blended finance and other things we talk about it. The other way is like the usual sort of venture capital model. How do you like uh, set up the milestones, et cetera? So that is some of the things we've been doing. How do you create like non-obvious long gestation period deep tech uh, uh, companies, uh, but in an asset light manner, uh, which can have uh, impact both in the near term as well as the long term. Thank you, Kiran. And uh, I think we'll touch upon some of those points that you mentioned earlier in terms of the long gestation period and how do we balance that. But I'll move to uh, Rema now, and then finally, uh, you know, to, to you, Shri, to uh, uh, contribute towards this. So I'm not going to add to, I think both Anand and Kiran comprehensively described what deep tech was, and so I'm not going to repeat that. Just want to add one uh, nuance to it is in terms of the fact that in the case of uh, food, we also make it more broader at Agri because basically a lot of industrial uh, also comes from agri and so uh, we need to have food goes beyond, uh, agri goes beyond food, so that was one. The second thing is the fact that uh, IP has to be global IP. So basically because this, that's what makes it uh, um, uh, something that is scalable and can address. Uh, can, can address beyond uh, self being self-reliant and addressing India's uh, economic issues. Um, from an impact perspective, I see deep science and engineering having to address three key things, that it makes it affordable. Today, a large part of the globe uh, cannot afford a lot of stuff. And what science can do is basically um, bring down new ways of doing things and make it more affordable. The second is that accessibility, basically because of the fact of the way in which things have got developed over the last century is that it's not the, the accessibility issue is still something that science, disruptive science is what can, can address. Uh, so which is two pillars of impact. And the third pillar of impact is the fact that advancement of science leads to newer discoveries and newer, uh, um, newer uh, 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 issues, so newer solutions to problems that have existed. So for example, like what Anand's company does is basically a problem that exists globally. And so you're not trying to find out newer solutions of how you could address that. Right? So advancement of science is the other way that you then make it more affordable and access accessibility, uh, provide access to 
a set of population globally which do not have that kind. And so that's where the real impact comes in. And this, especially when you take the three core um, uh, sectors, which is agri, health, and climate, it pretty much affects every human being and every living creature on the earth, but it does the, the, the poor a lot more than it does the rich. Right? And so, so that's where we think that uh, impact uh, gets created when you invest into uh, deep tech is, where, uh, is the way that we look at it as. So one of the examples I would say is a fact is, for example, we have a company called as uh, String Bio, which, uh, which converts methane gas uh, into alternate proteins currently, but is creating a platform for, for alternate proteins. Now, this is not only about uh, create alternate proteins for human consumption, but it's actually for the, for the uh, it could be proteins that go into, say, cosmetics, which otherwise would, would depend on, uh, on uh, say, soya bean. So then you're fighting for land. Or it creates proteins for the aqua industry, which is fighting with the fact that global warming is and overfishing has reduced trash fish globally. And so how do you address that? And so methane gas can be converted into something that could address these two issues, or it could set up a circular economy that's waste from a poultry farm can go back as feed for them. So that's deep tech science. So that's how we define uh, impact getting created. And those are the kind of companies that we, we would consider under this bucket. Thanks, Rima. Sri, any comments to add to what others have been saying? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, in, in the whole world of what, what I call deep tech, and I'd really like to give an insight into what makes this a little more uh, difficult, but also at the same time makes it longer lasting, uh, the fruits of this uh, endeavor. Usually deep tech starts with um, an idea, a scientific possibility. You know, there is no reason why physics says or chemistry says such a thing is not possible, but nobody's done that before. Okay, so uh, from a scientific possibility, the first thing that most deep tech people do is trying to say, okay, can I make sure that it's at least technically feasible? And this phase alone takes about three to five years. Okay, and, and after technical feasibility, you, you talk about, okay, but it may not actually make money. It may not, it may not, I mean, it, it works, but it's not commercially viable. So then you do some more engineering, some more retrofitting, some more scale up, some more uh, uh, a, a process development, and then that could take another two years. You, you see, you've got the commercial feasibility, you've got a prototype product. And then finally, you're talking about global scalability, which would be another three years. So you're talking a minimum from the idea to a, to a global scalability, you're talking about 10 year, seven to 10 year time horizon, okay? And this is the reason. But you know, the, the thing that happens here is that it results in a very big paradigm shift. And naturally, as Anand said, it generates IP. So what is the advantage of generating IP? IP gives you a 20 year time horizon and a monopoly. Now that is something that is well worth the investment, even if it takes seven years, because if you've got a product life cycle that, that has got a 20 year time horizon that beats everything. So the fundamental difference uh, between deep tech kind of products and what we see in the technology kind, which is a differentiation, is related to product life cycle. Drugs that were invented 15 years ago are still as relevant today. You can never say that about an app or a software program. So long-term investment, high investment, but very secure long-term returns. So that is a very classic differentiation of deep tech. Now, when you come to think of impact in deep tech, okay, I mean, there is without a doubt, biotechnology is at the core of this. I mean, look at Anand's company, look at my company. Biotechnology is the core of it. Why is biotechnology? Because biotechnology is the one that can feed the world, fuel the world, heal the world. Now, most of the applications of biotechnology about healing the world has been about healthcare. Why? Because that's where a lot of the returns are. Of course, Anand is, for example, in healthcare. Again, he has to go through a seven to 10 year life cycle, but there is, one more aspect of biotechnology that when combined with 
engineering. And we know today in our world, engineering is kind of, oh yeah, engineering, we talk about financial engineering, we call it digital engineering. We think engineering is all about writing software code. But engineering is classical. There is mechanical engineering, there is chemical engineering, there is civil engineering. That is the original engineering, electrical engineering, okay? When you combine biotechnology with classical engineering, you run into a scope of products which can really make huge differences, okay? And that's where companies like ours come in. We work in the interface of uh, biotechnology and classical engineering, okay? And innovate there. And there are, the fruits are rich. Now, compared to why, if you look, focus on India, you know, in Bangalore, Bangalore is a prime example, you know, many, 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 many software companies, many, many, but very few companies like Bugworks or String Biotech or, or even C6. Why? Because the labs and the infrastructure in which such work needs to be done is not easy to come by. You know, I, my favorite example is that you can take software, you just need a good high-speed LAN computer and great brains. You need all of that for deep tech, plus you need heavy grade infrastructure, which would cost you millions of dollars just to set up. We don't have those places. Ccamp is a prime example in Bangalore. That is why it requires much greater investment, much greater uh, sustained investment, but the returns, and you can live off those returns for a much longer time. So that is the classical difference between deep tech and technology as we see it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for setting that tone. So I guess we all converged around, you know, the risk of uh, deep tech, the differentiation between deep science and deep engineering that there are, you know, I like how you put it, Anand, unknown, unknowns. And in terms of, you know, the opportunity to build huge IP, and then I wouldn't say, you know, you referred Sri to monopoly, but the option to, and the opportunity to go global and to scale globally, and the areas, uh, you know, it's, it's really nice to hear that we're all thinking of the potential for deep tech to, uh, you know, create large scale impact among similar uh, areas such as, uh, uh, Shri, I like how you put it, food, fuel and heal. So food and agriculture, climate and healthcare, and uh, how Rema talked about making things more accessible and affordable. Uh, you know, and the concept of how deep science can, you know, create the, 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 an environment of adjacent possible, Kiran, you have spoken about that uh, earlier and how one invention can lead to another. Now, when we talk about global scalability and the IP, uh, the richness of IP, let's switch to the India opportunity. With tech startups, at least, we are seeing record number of unicorns, you're seeing high valuations, massive FDI inflow. And this is also the year that the Indian tech IPOs have come of age. Can we also say this of Indian deep tech, and I'm speaking of both deep science and deep engineering, a few years from now. So let's let's engage on that a little bit, Kiran. I'll start with you. UTech invests globally in deep tech from US to Japan and from that global vantage point, where do you see India placed in terms of both bits and atoms? And what would you say is India's USP and potential to create the next global Moderna or Tesla? Thanks for that. And uh, yeah, I think uh, India is fairly unique in terms of uh, multiple positioning. I usually say that India is a combination of four things, uh, which is that uh, probably India is the only emerging country that can parallel Silicon Valley uh, in terms of the pure technology innovation. So that's there. Second, although we get a Silicon Valley level innovation, there is a culture of frugality that is built in. Where, which means it leads to cost efficient business models. So you get a fairly affordable cost structure, which is super attractive for us as an investor, but also to build uh, companies, right? The, the culture of fiscal discipline is super important. So you have Silicon Valley level innovation, you have uh, a culture of frugality. Third, um, not as much as China, but still India has a fairly large enough B2B market. Most of the deep tech, I'm not saying deep tech innovations cannot be B2C, they can be, but they tend to be most of them B2B, business to business. So uh, unlike some of the smaller markets, India has a good enough uh, B2B market, which means that a startup can actually commercialize in India, make their product robust. But at the same time, Indian startups are also global kind of like Israel, not maybe Israeli startups are global from day zero, Indian startups are global from day, I don't know, 0 0.5. So it's the combination of these four things, the Silicon Valley level innovation, culture of frugality, 
the large B2B market, which can potentially parallel China uh, and a global sort of uh, outreach, which can potentially parallel Israel. So this combination of these four things makes India super unique, right? And at the end of the day, what I say is like Indian startups have the potential to innovate for the bottom five, six billion people, top one billion people too, potentially, maybe the engineering led solutions, but the science-based solutions can also have impact on the bottom five billion people. That let, let lends itself to a very attractive opportunity for us. And from our experience of investing in multiple places, one thing we are excited about India is for deep tech startups, we can talk about it much later. The concept that we are interested in is to find the pain technology fit. What is the key customer pain you're solving? Does your technology work? Is your technology the right solution to solve this customer pain? It's not product market fit, which comes much later. So it's for deep tech startups, it's much earlier. What is the pain technology fit as one of my colleague calls it? So that we see very clearly in Indian startups. So that's one of the reasons why we are investing heavily in India. Exits will come, those things will happen, but those are some of the unique characteristics. Excellent, excellent to hear. Now, Rema, coming to you from your vantage point of being a homegrown Indian impact investor, how have you seen the deep tech sector develop and how bullish are you about its future here? Do you see it at an inflection point to take off the way e-commerce and SaaS have? Um, so when we started off, which was the early part of the last decade, India, uh, while India has always had uh, uh, a tech play uh, in the biotech space, we were still in very, very early days. So our ecosystem was still not strong enough. While our academic institutions did have, they were not scaling up or they were not coming to the fore. What has happened over the last 10 odd years, and I would specifically pick up biotech as an area because that, that has an overlay about you know, health, agri, as well as climate. They, that, not that it takes with the others, but biotech has a strong role to play here. If I take that as an example, Bayrak over the last 10, 15 years has created a very strong ecosystem across India. And that the capital that came in at very early stages has enabled uh, a lot more uh, startups to start, uh, you know, to, uh, to come up and a lot more, uh, forget, uh, let's keep, sorry, I use the word wrong startups. I would say it's the fact a lot more uh, projects and a lot more uh, ideas and IPs are getting created than earlier because the kind of funding that Bayrak has been able to provide through its incubator network, as well as through various schemes that they have, has been very, very strong, creating a lot more IPs getting created. Now, that is what Bayrak played a role. And so that has created a sea change. Today, you see hundreds and hundreds of biotech. 10 years back, if you had called for biotech, you wouldn't have got any company worth investing in or even looking at it. But today that has changed. And I would give a lot of credit to Bayrak for what they have done in that space. Not to say others have not done, but I would give that credit. Now, given that what has created that, what we now are looking at is the fact that what happens next when an IP gets created or when there is a potential for an IP to get created? You need seed capital to come in. And that's where organizations like UTech are coming this way. We, at this point of time, there is already a data that has happened with what Bayrak has done. Right? And so essentially the product, there's, there's a definition that has come into the product. But there's still a lot of risks that remain. And that's where uh, we can possibly invest in, but we can't take the entire investment at that stage because of the fact there's still a lot of risks involved, especially if you consider, for example, health, in which might require three or four phases of trials that would be required. Now, that would require a different kinds of capital because you would then need to be investing only into, into a set of uh, uh, IPs which then you de-risk across a portfolio. Now that cannot happen with a, with a sector agnostic fund like ours, right? And so what I would say is the fact what has changed is that there's now seed capital available. There's, there's a lot more capital available for IP creation, which is at very, very early stages for academics. Which is one thing. This, and for uh, the second stage, which is seed stage, which is uh, you know, at, at, at 
very, very early stages. You now have capital that's available for entrepreneurs who want to take these IPs and want to commercialize it. The seed stage capital available, but it's still limited. We still need a lot more seed players to come in for, for creating, for enabling entrepreneurs to be able to commercialize it. Now, at that stage, we may need a lot more, which could perhaps be sector agnostic, like fund like ours, like yours, Chirate, or it could be, uh, you know, so that's one thing, we need a lot more. And we'd also need sector specific and uh, um, uh, use case specific funds that come in because that would then be able to lead us. We, we uh, you know, funds like Chirati and us can only lead us to a particular extent, but we can't take massive bets on, on companies that would need to be like, you know, Anand's companies. It requires a kind of capital. So I think we need biotech funds to be set up. So then next stage is where there is an issue. Now, the fact is that there are lots of these seed stage companies, entrepreneurs that are coming up. So it's a huge potential that we have of creating biotech from India for the globe. What's required now is a lot more capital to enable these companies to go beyond seed stage where we are now creating product market fit. So that's what we invest into. Now the commercialization stage would require a lot more capital. And for, to take it global, you need to have a lot more capital. We are now seeing some of that capital come in, but what we would need a lot more capital flow to happen here. It's a huge, huge opportunity. And um, like what Anand said about these three sectors, which is health, agri, and climate, I think is going to be trillions and trillions and hundreds of trillions of order, uh, uh, opportunity that lies out as a globe, as globally, these are recognized as the areas um, that needs investment. And that's, that's where um, uh, the, the opportunity lies. I think we could be at that. So I think seed stage to some extent and the larger one is where the, the, the capital flow would need to happen. That's a change that we are seeing. 10 years back, none of this was existing. Now we can clearly define where we are. We see the opportunity. We see money going in, where we see what more is needed. I think that's where we, we are at from an investment standpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Rema. And it's great to see that change over time. You know, you mentioned both Bayrak and Biotech. So I'll take it over to Sri now. Sri, you've been deeply entrenched in the biotech ecosystem from your days at Biocon and CCAMP and IIT. And you are a climate tech entrepreneur where C6 is now at the right place at the right time. So given that climate has become such a hot topic, how could India do in that sector as well as in the biotech sector from, you know, your experience and where you are? being able to look at uh, all these, uh, you know, young startups and the lab ideas in the lab, for, uh, you know, uh, 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 working together with Bayrak, et cetera. And what is the advantage that India offers to its entrepreneurs and investors? Hmm. Wow, uh, there, there are many, uh, we could speak for hours on this, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have time. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, let's a uh, uh, brief uh, uh, thing. Yes, indeed, uh, Bayrak has been one of the most uh, interesting things that have happened to India. And I was fortunate enough to be involved in the early days of creation of Bayrak when I was working briefly for the government. So, uh, and uh, before I started C6, so uh, it's, it's an absolutely, Bayrak can only do so much. And there's a huge dearth between where Bayrak leaves off and where uh, uh, investors pick up the seed state that Rema was speaking to, we desperately need more patient capital. And when I see, say patient capital, we need capital that can put money in, afford to take, wait for seven years without return. I mean, I think if you can fix this particular aspect, the relay race will be completed. Okay, India desperately needs that post initial direction setting and up to a point where you know a company can be spinning about five million dollars or so plus in revenue because after that people will come in droves okay somehow we must find a pool of capital i'd say a hundred million dollars or so spread your bets but the companies will just you know their the returns will be enormous let's just focus on climate because what look at india's situation and look at and i, I can trace this uh, back to C6. People relate to health. It's very easy because it, it affects each one of us personally. Climate is like a slow boil. 
you know it's like a you, you don't realize the, that it's like putting a frog into boiling water right it's raised the temperature nobody realizes until it's too late so when i quit you know i, I spent 25 years in the healthcare industry when i quit biocon i was teaching at the uh, at, at the iit and i'm just tracing my own journey because it tells you how we have to think as a as a country when when was when when I was in IIT, I had this bunch of students who eventually are now my co-founders, and we said, "Hey, listen, you know what? You guys are all biotechnology students. What about just you know looking at how we can apply biotechnology to solve India's major needs? What is India's major? And let's not do healthcare. Let's look at what is India's major need: climate change. Why? Because of all the developing economies in the world. Okay, India is the third largest consumer of energy." Right after US, right after China, India is the third largest consumer of energy. And we import all of our crude oil. Okay, where, I mean, and this is very fascinating. You say, oh my God, we import all of our crude oil. What, what about, you know, all of that crude oil is being burnt into carbon dioxide. We are adding the third largest share of that crude oil back into the atmosphere, warming the atmosphere. And so do we have a responsibility to wean ourselves off that crude oil. We import 250 million tons of crude oil in a year. If we had to make that with biofuels, and that was a challenge, if we had to make that with biofuels, and why biofuels? Because biofuels are sustainable. They take today's carbon dioxide, convert it to biomass, which you can convert back into biofuels. So when you go to biofuels, you don't add the ancient carbon dioxide from millions of years ago that comes into the atmosphere. So it's very simple, right? You can take all the biomass. Why don't we just grow the biomass and we convert it into biofuels? Till you run the calculations. To make 250 million tons of crude oil, we need a billion tons of biomass. And India, India's entire agricultural output is a billion tons of biomass. What do we feed our people if we, if we were to make biofuels? And nobody except India has this problem. Okay, we are a very populous country. We have to feed ourselves. At the same time, we have to be sustainable. There is not enough biomass. And that's where the, it, it's just interesting. You sit in India, you wake up every day. You say, oh my God, we're we are the third largest importer of energy. We, we don't have enough land for agriculture. Even if we had land, we don't have irrigation water. What can we do? Hey, we have lots of sea around India. Why don't we do agriculture on the sea? Pick up the sun's energy by doing agriculture on the sea. In one neat step, you can sidestep the entire food versus fuel debate. And that is what C6 Energy turned, uh, set out to do. It said, well, oh, there are plants that grow in the sea. They're called seaweeds. So why isn't everybody farming the sea? Because there is no technology. I mean, the seaweed farming is in the stone ages compared to agriculture on land. But here we are sitting in an institute with a biotechnology department, with a mechanical engineering department, with the ocean engineering department. What a wonderful way of putting all these technologies together to really create a paradigm shift to harvest the sunlight, create this ultimate sustainable source of biomass, which we have done over the last 11 years. We've actually invented seaweed farming systems and sustainable uh, you know, sea tractors and shown that you can convert this biomass to crude oil. Now, imagine if we can grow biomass around the seas of India and, and the area you require, you know, it's just a, the area equal, equivalent to a Tamil Nadu or a Punjab on the sea. So there's more than enough area around the Andaman and the Nicobar Islands. Imagine if you could grow all this biomass, we convert it into crude oil and we supply all our refineries in India with this crude oil. Everything that you get downstream of the refineries, your petrol, your diesel is all renewable. Everything suddenly changes. All we have to do is master this ability to do agriculture on the sea. We are so blessed as a country. As a tropical country, we have the maximum amount of sunlight, our share of sunlight falling on the seas around us. And you know, all we need to do, the entire planet needs to harvest only 0.1% of the sunlight that's falling on the planet on any one day to satisfy all of the planet's energy needs. But it's an area game, right? Sunlight falls, you're, you need large areas to pick it up, pick it up on the sea. So that was the genesis. But I'm telling you how, if we hadn't been in India, if we hadn't been in that engineering institution, if we didn't wake up every day saying, 
oh my God, we have to feed a billion people and we are the largest consumer. I bet you this idea would not have occurred. So this is a very classic example. People often ask me, why did, how come nobody else thought of this idea? Because you have to be sitting in India and it's not just me, it's like Anand. You have to be facing that drug resistant bacteria day in and day out because of the over prescription. And then you get an idea. And then we apply our innovation and then we can change everything for the whole world. This is the power of India. Okay. Fantastic, fantastic. Shri, that, that's fantastic. And Anand, you, you know, uh, Shri referred to you and AMR and Bugworks and how that uh, came out. Wow. So as you've been on both the deep engineering and the deep science sides of IP and innovation in your career, as an entrepreneur, and I know that you also support the lab to market pipeline of smaller startups. What is the India? Yeah, your voice is not coming out properly. There's hey, a, there's, uh, yeah, there is some background. Uh, I could, I could sort of make out what you're saying, Vidya, but we will manage. No problem. So, uh, yeah, very difficult to speak after Sri after he has. You can hear his uh, his energy and his passion. Uh, just to set certain context, right? To take off from where uh, Rama and uh, like Kiran also left off. We are fortunate to have someone like Shri here. He's one of the architects of Bayrak. And it's because of DBT that hundreds of companies got created in India. So once again, it's a shout out to DBT and Bayrak and all the great people who created that 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 important Bayrak. Professor Raghavan and Dr. Rainsvarup require special mention. Absolutely, ma'am. I didn't use any particular names, but you're absolutely right. Without DBT and Bayrak. There is no biotech in India. You know, we have been left with only three or four companies. And it's not just companies, uh, Rama, that were spawned of. It's ecosystems. C-Camp, uh, Bangalore Biocluster, IKP Eden, and I can go on. I think there are about 14 institutions set up, which people like Shri, uh, Shri and I are using, which otherwise we would have to build plant and machinery. So it's great that the India today, ladies and gentlemen, is India that's got the talent, that's got the ecosystem, that actually has government support. DBT is one of the best uh, experiences I've had with government. What we're lacking is patient capital, back to what Sri was saying. And Vidya, back to your question is, I think the point that Sri made, contextual innovation. When you look at antimicrobial resistance, just to tell a story to everybody here, the last new antibiotics happened in the 1960s. After that, it's just been generation one plus one plus one plus one. We're losing a million people per year. That's 10 lakh per year to antimicrobial resistance, of which 35% is from India. Big pharmaceutical companies don't want to work in this space because it's a hard problem to crack and the economics are questionable and most of the problems are happening in countries like India. Indian pharmaceutical companies are doing a great job in generics. They're not fixing the problem. Who's going to fix this problem? A problem that's so endemic to us that's taking number of people per year equivalent to what COVID is doing but year on year on year. And if COVID has taught us something, it is because of India's vaccine industry, PP industry, bio, uh, our med tech industry that really stood up and saved India. If we didn't have the vaccines and the PPE manufacturers and the technology textile people, we wouldn't have lost 4 lakh people. We would have lost 40 lakh people on official count. So it's a major wake up call that indigenous technologies will come to save India when we hit a pandemic or when we hit a drought or when we hit a huge fuel crisis like what Sri was alluding to in terms of our fuel race. So in my journeys with you, what I've found is contextual innovation. From India, you can do it very parsimoniously. You can use the local ecosystem better than my counterparts in Boston or Bay Area. Okay. They have access to capital that we don't, but we have access to superbugs. We have access to clinicians who understand how these bugs are evolving. We have access to patients. So contextual innovation is very important. Second thing is the major change that I am seeing with investors, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'm deeply thankful that Kiran and UTEC chose to invest in bug works when nobody would touch us. Nobody would touch us in 2018. And Shri Kumar, among others, supported us in 2016 when we were nothing, right? So deeply thankful to these people who made a difference, both like a UTEC and angel investors like Shri. What am I seeing in the market segment today with their big change? In the last 12 to 18 months, major private equity companies are parking in India. We ourselves, are in talks with private equity company, which is unbelievable to think that they're coming into biotech, agrotech, India. Why are they coming in? They're realizing that Indians can innovate for the lower 6 billion of the 7 billion, to use Kiran's comment, the lower 6 billion or 6.5 billion. 
there are real markets there are real problems and ladies and gentlemen everybody is looking at esg as part of blending their portfolio so if you have a 200 billion dollar portfolio at least 10% 15% is impact and an esg uh, uh, flavoring on top so there is a change the pandemic has accelerated the change esg is becoming a foundational principle for many pes and for some vcs and they are realizing that there are hidden gems in india just yesterday evening i was in a call with a large pe from new york and i asked him why are you speaking to us you don't know who bugworks is there are so many great companies you can invest in he said no we are looking for hidden gems in india we trust indian ip you guys are not controversial like your your neighbors in asia we trust your ip we trust the talent you're solving for a very large population so all these things are stacked well for us to shri kumar's point if we can fill this gap between dbt coming off the grants to series a this is the valley of death that we need to you know there are very few ankurs there are very few utex there are very few india capitals in that space and with that that's the gap we need to fill i want to make two more points the government is understanding that biotech agrotech is going to save india because the pandemic showed that very easily and we are a country that spends only 1.2% of gdp on health and 0.7% of gdp on science and technology there is going to be a market change in how we are going to look at these things shri kumar is well aware that we as able are talking to the government to make the government come in along with these almost one is to one every dollar that somebody puts into investing maybe the government says i will come in and step in at 50 cents or 75 cents or a 1 dollar tax breaks capital gains exemptions if you put if you put money into deep science and deep tech government is also thinking that way no society that has done well in biotech has done so without the support of government and the sustained and deep support of government so i see the change the 6 billion solution contextual innovation pes esg pandemic making a huge change and the fact that government wants to actively participate with private capital to boost investment in this sector so i'm actually quite bullish excellent anand i think you've summarized it very well very succinct and uh, i keep hearing you know a, this repeated a few times the value of debt based need for patient capital and of course on the government side we'll talk about it a little later when we look at how how do we unlock india's opportunities but great to know that you know we have an ecosystem which is which is very vibrant at the startup stage i'll now move to the investing side of it so that we can understand what is different about a deep tech investment so kiran starting with you you spoke earlier about the pain tech fit now what is the hallmark of a good deep tech investment for you tech what is your diligent process like and as an investor what is your ideal portfolio construction given the slightly different nuances when it comes to a deep tech investment versus a, a a uh, regular tech investment if you can just shed some light on this thank you very much yeah i think excellent comments from uh, fellow panelists as well by the way uh, healthcare and we talked about a lot of innovation on healthcare and biotech but equally important are also like manufacturing which can help india create long term wealth supply chain transparency in i don't know pricing commodities so there are many elements to impact right i just wanted to make that point so in terms of deep tech investments right or like startups uh deep tech companies are kind of zero billion dollar companies so what i mean to say is that the outcomes are extreme right either you there is a tesla moderna or you there is a zero so which is, which is which which lends itself to an interesting sort of thing you and you alluded to portfolio construction my own portfolio construction strategy is for every investment in atom which is real world i have every investment in bit so or or another way to say it is for every science led innovation i have an engineering led innovation to balance the commercialization sort of like uh, speed uh so that uh, so that so that uh, it 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 creates a balanced portfolio uh in terms of de risking or what are the technology uh, elements that we or what are the elements that we look for in a deep tech company and how can we de risk every company has a team risk and, and market risk right market is like is the market big enough uh, is the market uh, acceptable to the problem and solution team is like there are three things maybe for deep tech companies that we look at like uh, among the team members does any one of them have a domain expertise do they have affinity to sell doesn't mean that they have to be great sales people but do they have the affinity to sell and do they have the resilience because there is like well deep tech startups have just two kind of thing right either absolute euphoria that you're going to change the world or absolute terror that unfortunately you're going to die out so to go through that sort of resilience apart from those there are four specific risks that are uh, specific to deep tech companies which we try to de risk first is the technology itself uh, so does this technology work 
is a key thing. And that is where we spend a lot of our time doing due diligence. We are University of Tokyo Edge Capital. We have a good network of uh, um, academics uh, who support us, our portfolio companies, uh, and so on and so forth. So that is one where we put in an effort. Second is, even if the technology is good, can it actually be productized? Uh, and in this, one of the key things we've found, the, the deep tech startups that have done well are almost all invariably the ones who do product development and customer development hand in hand. Bugworks is an example. They will probably release their drugs after eight years, but Anand has been talking to, and, and his team has been talking to customers from day one or day two. Uh, so doing that product development and customer development hand in hand, and how soon can you factor in the customer feedback into your product development? That de-risking is super important. That's probably, so you say, sort of de-risking. The other problem is we as sort of seed, series A investors, what we ourselves face is, as Sri mentioned, once the company hits revenue, probably there is capital. But how do we get them to that point? So the other third risk is, apart from the technology product risk, is the capital risk. So how do we de-risk that? That is where we try to form syndicates in this next subsequent round. Well, first itself is like, we ourselves are a large fund, so we have large reserves for the, for the companies that we invest in so that we can get them to enough milestones to raise further round of capital. But we also bring in other corporate investors. For example, sometimes corporates are much more interested in this because of multiple reasons. Uh, we bring in, like as Anand was mentioning, impact investors. There are sovereign wealth funds, there are PEs and others who are interested. So forming that capital. And the last uh, uh, risk, which is more specific to deep tech companies again, is uh, regulatory risk. So is there a way to commercialize uh, bypassing it or even before that is there a way to validate it or what is your least expensive fastest path to the market so i think we focus a lot of our time of due diligence on the technology risk product risk capital risk and regulatory risk and when we also invest that is where we tend to add value so can we help like for example bugos we are helping them collaborate with a japanese researcher on the technology side for tricog we are helping them with go to market uh, I have a company in Agara, uh, which we are helping him on the team side uh, and to raise capital. So that is where we try to build our platform team and Chirate probably has that too. Uh, and probably even Ankur too, where we try to support the companies uh, in order to de-risk those uh, elements uh, as we go forward. So every round essentially should be a de-risking of something or the other. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the way that we think about it. Thanks, Kiran. And I'd like to pick up on that point you mentioned about syndicating and you know getting some kind of a coalition later, especially in the context of climate. But very quickly, Rema, uh, any anything to add in terms of you know your Ankur's deep tech investment process and what founders can expect the journey to be like? So it's no different from what Kiran mentioned. So he kind of covered. So I'm not going to repeat that given the interest of time. But what I would like to add is perhaps a B the absence in the ecosystem and due to which there are certain kinds of deep tech investments cannot get invested in. That's basically the cohort risk. Right? So if I have to invest into molecule development, I need to do maybe you know, 50 molecules to ensure or whatever 100 molecules to ensure that one would succeed. Right? So similarly, if I have to invest into companies that are looking at, say, looking at new molecule development, whatever be the end use case, right? I would need to create a cohort. Now then, which would mean that you would need to have specialized funds. So if I look at putting, pointing out to what the gaps are in the ecosystem and where we would need to put money into is basically uh, specialized funds, which would take on those risks. So that's a risk that's currently absent at this point of time in India among all, because we are all generalist funds, like in other words. So it's not easy for us to take those kind of bets. So I would reply to the gap that's there in the ecosystem, but uh, our process is very similar to what Kiran said, which is looking at uh, early stage and these are the risks that we would need to cover. I think a uh, uh, very good point, Rima, and that's a good segue for us to talk about climate change, which can potentially impact the economy about a thousand times worse than the pandemic. So there's a massive unmet need right now for thousands of silver bullets in this area. And a large amount of capital is also being poured into the sector but in, I would not say in a necessarily coordinated manner, right? So even though we have about 43 global unicorns in climate tech right now, there are 30 in mobility. So the, a question to the investors, and this, this takes, you know, takes it, the, the thought forward in terms of specialized VCs, is uh, you know, consortiums like the First Movers Consortium or there's the Breakthrough Energy Catalyst Fund, which feeds into the Breakthrough Energy Ventures, 
What are your thoughts on climate as a sector in terms of looking at collectively in terms of what the urgent areas are and the innovations and how private market investments, uh, investors, as well as the government and other players coordinate better together to target the top areas where we need to go deep first in the climate space. Uh, Kiran, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, so for UREC itself, we don't have a uh, climate specific sort of uh, uh, anything sort of like that. But though we have multiple investments in, for example, decarbonization and uh, and uh, in, in, in general, like sustainable materials uh, and sustainable um, uh, energy as well, like electric vehicles and so on and so forth. But broadly speaking, there are three types of uh, private investment points which come up, right? One is sort of like the ones that use ESG principles itself as a primary investment criteria. You can say that they are ESG uh, enabled or primarily ESG funds. That is one end of the spectrum. On the other end are the exclusionary funds or screening funds where they say, hey, we are not going to invest in certain things like tobacco or alcohol or something else like gambling or whatever it is. So those are exclusionary somewhere in the middle is probably what, what Shirate like is like which is like ESG integrated funds so where so ESG uh, exclusionary is more like divestment uh, ESG enabled is like using ESG principles itself as a primary investment making criteria but ESG integrated is somewhere where you engage with the company in order to bring in that ESG element so uh, it's important that all three sort of are there but for example, like when we try to work with, you mentioned breakthrough energy and other, I think that's very important because they are, they feature on one end of the spectrum. It's also important that we collaborate with the other ends because it's the triple bottom line, right? Initially companies cared or even the stock market, the markets cared mainly about profits and then caring about profits and people, but now it's profits, people and planet as well. So it's important that sort of like, because impact investing is about impact and also financial returns. So I think the combination working with all these three types of the funds that I mentioned is sort of like important to add value. But that being said, I think mm. the sector focused funds on climate, it is very important to help not just in the investment, but also in the capacity building, right? Because at the end of the day, the worst thing to that could happen is the same thing that happened in 2006, et cetera, 2006 to 14, where energy investments completely kind of died and it created billions of dollars of needless loss, right? So that how to avoid that is sort of like, yeah, not pursuing technology for the sake of it, uh, but like for the sake of actually commercializing and creating impact. So I think that is where the private investors and the sector focused funds can collaborate together. Okay. Um, and I think that there's a transition risk that you're mentioning or alluding to where there's a chicken and an egg problem for demand and supply. And perhaps that's where purchase commitments by government could also come in. Um, Rema, any, any comments on this before I perhaps move to uh, Anand to tell us a little bit more about Bugworks? So just quickly, just to add what Kiran mentioned is the fact that what is needed both in India and globally, in India especially because we don't have too many climate focused funds. So, and we are all diverse uh, sector agnostic funds. So we would have climate as uh, climate uh, uh, focused uh, companies in our portfolio, but it's not a climate focused fund, right? And so what is needed is climate focused funds, um, basically in order to ensure, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vast area and a vast sector by itself. And there are multiple uh, areas within those. And at this point of time, still, still a lot of these seem to be focused like, for example, you know, a lot more on EV vehicles. Yeah. But what, what needs to be done also is in terms of battery, uh, you know, the waste that's going to come out, out of that. So, so more holistic approaches are needed. And uh, that is obviously, you know, there, there are a lot of startups that are working in this area, but what is needed is more uh, funds that are going to be focused on what is that the opportunity is to set up climate focused funds in India. And, yeah, yeah, uh, and the collaboration so between them yeah. on the problem space. That's where I would say is the opportunity is putting it from an opportunity perspective of what is what's the thing there. There are a lot of startups that are working, but we need to look at how the capital goes flows to them. Okay. Uh, Sri, a couple of uh, very quick comments on the potential that C6 Energy can have on many different areas, just using seaweed cultivation and production. You're obviously touching a lot of different uh, uh, areas. So would you like to add anything on 
you know, what you've already mentioned before, before yeah. I take it to Anand and AMR. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, the original idea of C6 Energy was the biofuel and the broad vision and still remains that. But, you know, in a practical world, we still have to make money with, as we go along to our ultimate goal, we still have to become a viable com uh, uh, company. So what is amazing is that the sea plant or seaweed, it can be treated like a versatile raw material. And what we have found is that you can take the sea plant material and basically in three broad buckets, you can actually make a lot of product. The first area which you've actually commercialized, which is what is earning us revenues, profits, whatever else, is in agriculture. And what we have found is that you can, from these sea seaweeds, you can extract certain compounds, and we have patents on these published, which can improve the productivity of land-based agriculture. So from the same area, you can produce anywhere between 10% to 30% more food for no additional inputs. What's the climate impact? I mean, look at the impacts. The first one is that, you know, you can reduce usage of fertilizer by about 15 to 25%. And fertilizer, by the way, urea, for instance, is one of the largest, large contributors to climate change because the process of manufacture of urea actually emits a lot of carbon dioxide. So we, we can reduce the use of fertilizer. You get more food output. So you can actually feed more people. And, what, and then the thing is that, which is very strange, is that when you get more biomass growing from the same piece of land for the same inputs, what is biomass? Biomass is nothing but carbon dioxide from the air, water from the ground, pasted together with sunlight, and that is biomass. So when more food grows in the same area, it actually we found, for example, when we did trials with corn in the US, two consecutive seasons, 2018, 2019, we could trap for every acre of corn growing, we could trap 1.3 tons extra of carbon dioxide over and above conventional agriculture. So you take a 90 million acres of corn, even if you were to take one, uh, one third or one fourth of that, you could trap 30 million tons of carbon dioxide for a pittance, for something like six to $10 per ton. Now, the, the beautiful thing is that the farmer doesn't have to go out and say, oh, I'm going to capture carbon dioxide because if the farmer gets 10% yield extra, they get four to five times more value than what the inputs that they put in, in terms of the product that we make from the seeker. So, you know, it's a total win-win situation. Produces more food for the planet, produces, captures more carbon dioxide, uh, farmers are happy. So this is an amazing situation. So this is, this product is going all over the world right now. Now, the seed plants are very versatile. You know, they're actually a polymer. So one of the things that we're doing, even before we get to the biofuel is we have, made, we have figured out how to make it into biodegradable plastics, okay? So we have actually got prototypes. That is some of the things that are coming up in the future. So in the area of agriculture, renewable materials and food and feed ingredients. Now, when we grow sea plants on a large scale, think about it, what do they do? The sea plants that we're growing right now, the seaweeds, we, we use this term interchangeably, capture carbon dioxide and, uh, 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 and water and they make carbohydrates and they produce a source of energy. But we can use the same growing systems to capture nitrogen from the atmosphere. Talk about natural nitrogen fixation. There is a huge nitrogen fixation cycle going on in the sea. We can create protein for the world. Okay. By, so these are all amazing things that can be done by the next frontier of agriculture. This is the whole potential. As a company, we are, we're just gotten started on this entire journey. But you know, this is something the entire world needs to jump into. The oceans are our future. Okay, this fantastic, is fantastic, fantastic, Sri. And and indeed, you know, it, it it is not easy. You haven't jumped into this overnight. It's taken plenty, you know, a lot of hard work behind where you are yeah. right now. But I'll move this and over. Just, the, a, just a point to add. You know, we, you added a little bit about the value of debt, and I want to give you an idea of why this is important here. What happens to a company like us or like Bugworks? Okay. In the early days, when, when as an early mover in the field, you have you see all the opportunities. What is the first priority of a company when they see opportunities? Not like we're more brilliant than anybody else. We just got started earlier. You want to capture all the possible ramification in the IP. In other words, you want to invest a whole lot of research, not just in the first product, but also in all the biomaterials or the, the thing. Now that requires a huge expenditure of R&D while you're still taking place. 
that is where the value of death comes in because we have to spend like crazy on research not just on one product but to capture the opportunity capture the ip for posterity so that we can then open it up which is exactly what we had to do which is what anand has to do okay that's what leads to the value of death otherwise you lose Absolutely. that opportunity yeah and anand you've spoken about that earlier when we spoke uh, you know in our pre discussions uh, i realize we have about 5 minutes left but really we haven't heard much from you on bug works and you know one of the last sessions that we had planned for this uh, this particular hour was uh, to talk about the issues we've spoken already about i think touched on government and the role of collaboration need for patient capital more specialized vcs so i'd like to focus a little bit on bug works now and what has your sure. journey been and you know what is the problem you're trying to solve so with you the problem we are trying to solve is is huge it impacts sdg of of most countries including india lack of any new antibiotics in about 50 years the heavy abuse of existing antibiotics and the build up of drug resistance india is unfortunately at the very epicenter of amr as i said we lose 3 and 1/2 lakh people year on year and that's growing and if you go to a hospital today and pick up an infection most likely the first two lines of antibiotics may not even work for you they go straight for meropenem which is the most advanced antibiotic because most likely you will lose the patient we lose 100000 babies less than the age 21 days to neonatal sepsis she is born in a district hospital she picks up a superbug in the hospital uh, environment and none of the antibiotics work this is the problem we came to fix and uh, it's a tough problem because these bugs have been living for billions of years with you and they're very smart so to find a target inside a bacteria uh, that you can that you can create a drug that is going to go in and kill the bacteria without getting kicked out is very very difficult so when we started this company it was very fortuitous for us that astrazeneca india just just closing its shop outstanding talent i came out of cell works brought some modeling simulation engineering knowledge startup knowledge and we married that with microbiology biochemistry uh, classical pharmaceutical techniques to create bug works but i realized very early like shri said when you are first mover you fall you get up you fall you get up but you want to capture as much space as you can so apart from solving serious hospital infections with there we are also working on bioterrorism the same assets that can save someone from a blood stream infection or a urinary tract infection can also potentially save countries all over the world from bioterrorism acts such as anthrax plague meliodisis etc was that a big defocus no it was an adjacency that we create it's important in deep science and deep tech that we look for such adjacencies and we broaden our horizon without defocus the final thing that we are working and in antibiotics with there we are starting our clinical trials in 3 weeks time in australia phase 1 trials if the phase 1 trials are successful we'll come to india and the united states for a phase 2 trial in serious abdominal infection or urinary tract infection so we are at a cusp very nervous but very very excited because it's very rare for a brand new idea to become a brand new molecule to solve such a big problem that's going into phase 1 uh, you know cautiously highly cautiously optimistic the last point i want to mention is oncology india is losing too many people to to cancer as we know and immuno oncology is a hot new area except with there the average cost of an immuno oncology drug is 80 to 100000 per person per year we can't afford it so we are working on affordable solutions in immuno oncology and hopefully we'll announce uh, a breakthrough solution before the end of the year for certain solid cell tumors but the company's original mandate is amr bioterrorism or biodefense and now immuno oncology we're very very excited and if we can look at monetizing our products over the globe so you make money in the western markets but yet make it affordable and accessible to lmics that will make it a good holistic solution and that's what we are working for fantastic anand and there's one common theme that i've picked up from many speakers today is adjacency and there's a framework of adjacent possible so one door leading to another and i think that's very very true of deep science and deep engineering scaling uh, things to impact with that i'm going to ask the panelists very it's been a very exciting discussion and we can go on i think for hours but we do need to bring this to a close there's one question if anybody can answer it in less than 30 seconds who are the early stage seed capital suppliers to deep tech globally are they largely successful entrepreneurs or successful deep tech companies would anybody like to just pick that up well, this is specifically in india is it i think globally yeah it says globally 
Uh, Shri, you, you had a point. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the people who understand the risks are actually, in my opinion, the, the best are the angel investors who understand the field, who, who quickly can dive in and who know the risk. And these are people who basically invest in companies like Bugworks because they're passionate about it. They don't mind losing that money. I mean, it's small amounts of money. They don't mind losing that money. It's the about taking that, encouraging, encouraging that idea to go forward so that it can succeed, so that somebody else can pick it up. And honestly, that's the kind of people who need to come in, who says, I'm passionate about this. I don't mind. Small amounts works a lot like that. I mean, it's like a buy rack into say two or three. You know, that that's basically, because this is like a gamble. This is like a gamble. Okay, and you you have to just bet on that, and then go for it. so that's my that's my idea and early stages. So thanks, thanks, Shri. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it back to the organizers with a tremendous note of thanks to all the panelists. Some fantastic thoughts out there, and thank you very much. Over to you, Trina and Senkal. Thank you so much, Vidya, and thank you to all panelists. Uh, we will wrap up here, but we have a number of interesting sessions lined up. I will just share the same on the chat box. Please do attend our, the next sessions at 2 p.m., starting 2 p.m.